So what do we do with the chaos of transit claims? And what, how do, can ordinary people sort of sort through all the stuff they hear? I suggest that you think in terms of a spectrum of authorities. Think about a statement that somebody makes and think about where in this hierarchy that statement lives. Um, and then think, OK, this is a hierarchy from geometry and math on the one end to, to our, mo our most intimate feelings on the other hand, which um, where the, the position of this hierarchy has a, helps you to understand what kind of statement is going to refute what other kind of statement. So that's an example. A geometry or math statement is something like 2 plus 3 is 5. A physics statement is something like electricity and fossil fuels are both ways of storing energy. A biology statement is something like a mammal's need to consume water increases with temperature. And as we move up this axis, notice what's happening. The sphere of relevance of the statement is gradually diminishing. Right? Geometry and math statements are true anywhere in the universe. Physics statements probably are too, although we're maybe fractionally less sure of that. Biology statements are clearly only true on this planet. Right? Um, then psychology statements are true only of us, and, and we're continuing the whole human race. And so we're continuing to diminish this sphere as we make more and more pointed statements. So psychology will say things about human behavior. Then you get to culture, which is generally where you find statements like most middle class Americans hate riding buses. Generalizations about groups of people is usually what a cultural statement looks like. Then deep, deep under that, though, are really our feelings. And by our, I mean basically me and the people I talk to, my family, my friends, the people who are my own Fox News echo chamber that tell me back what I want to hear, <laughs> and ultimately that help me feel certain and confident about whatever my feelings are. That's what I call the domain of our feelings. And then finally, of course, you get to the domain of my feelings. Uh, and when we get to that domain, we're very clearly talking about something that's only true inside ourselves. And so that is the thing about which we have the greatest certainty and also the greatest intensity. <coughs> it is also, of course, the least relevant outside of ourselves. So this is a spectrum from cold to hot, obviously. Uh, geometry and math statements sound very cold. They are uninspiring. They don't raise your heart rate. As you go further up this, this, uh, this hierarchy, though, you get to things that are more and more hot. And finally, you get to really the only things that are truly real to all of us, which are our own emotions. Um, now, the important thing about, so what I'm going to suggest is take transit, transit claims that you hear and try to locate them on this hierarchy. Because if you do, you can start having really clear thoughts about them. One real thought is that a statement from lower down this hierarchy really does overrule or uh, a statement that's higher up on the hierarchy. And I'll give you, a, and so here's a simple, it's a beautiful example. This is called the fundamental attribution error, and I've written about it in the blog. Um, take the cultural statement, most middle class Americans hate riding buses. Psychology says something very interesting about that. Psychology <coughs> says that it, is a, it is, seems to be an aspect of the human brain that it overestimates the rationality of its own decisions and underestimates the rationality of other people's decisions. And what that says here is that when you're making a cultural generalization, like most middle class Americans hate riding buses, what you're doing is perhaps observing from some kind of large national data set that, yeah, a lot of middle class Americans choose not to ride buses. And you're assuming that that's because of who they are. Um, you're assuming that that's for a cultural reason that they do that. When, in fact, these people may, be, may actually be acting rationally but acting rationally in a situation that you don't completely understand. Another obvious example that we'll hear a lot that we, is, is, you'll often hear a lot of in this part of the country is, is generalizations about Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a car culture. Los Angeles is a culture where people are just going to get in their cars because that's just who they are. We hear that a lot. Um, no, actually, Los Angeles is a place where, uh, for a large number of people making a large number of trips, a car is the logical thing to use. There, um, I don't think it's necessary to imagine that Los Angeles is a car culture, or that there's a cultural reason for why people are doing what they're doing. There is a land use and urban design reason why people are doing what they're doing. It's the nature of the city that they've built, and the nature of the kinds of trips they have to make in that city, which are relatively long. So um, that's an example of saying that scientific facts are going to routinely challenge and overrule higher and more subjective facts. So this whole hierarchy is obviously a, a, runs from cold to hot. The cold statements are the most universal, uh, true everywhere, even on other galaxies in all, in all likelihood. Um, the hot statements are the most subjective. 
Uh, as a result, the cold statements are extremely reliable. Uh, 3 plus 2 is 5 is may, may not raise your heartbeat, but on the other hand, you can really count on it. You know? And that's, that's one of the important things about geometry and math. And it's one of the reasons why I, in particular, in my work, am constantly coming back to statements about geometry and math, which I'll do at home. Now, cold statements are also timeless. They're not only true everywhere, they're true every when. Um, and cor but correspondingly, the most subjective statements also feel most urgent. They are the things that, that get us excited, our own emotions. So ultimately, this is a spectrum from notions that are universal, reliable, but dull and abstract, to notions that are subjective and unreliable, but urgent and intense and real and, and, and motivated. So how do we manage and, and any kind of planning process now, any kind of decision, any kind of political process about a particular project or a particular, particular anything that we need to talk about together, you're going to see the interaction between these two forces. Um, and, you're going to, if, and you will really benefit if you can actually locate the statements that people are making and, and understand whether they're saying something about geometry or something about psychology or something about their own feelings. Um, because all those are valid statements, but they work differently. And some really do under, uh, overrule others. So you could say, if you want to just put some common terms in this hierarchy, that the concept of practicality tends to rise out of the cold end of the spectrum. Ultimately, math, physics, uh, which become engineering, which become basic limits on what you can and can't do physically. Um, coming in the other direction from our feelings are the notion of vision but also the notion of nimbyism. And I'm going to argue that both of those things ultimately arise out of, a very, of one of our most important emotions, which is the notion of home. The notion of what, of what home is and what needs to be done about home. We're always trying to get this balance right, though, because great ideas need both. Uh, and we're always negotiating with nimbyism and with conservatism in general, defined in the classic sense of just generalized resistance to fast change. We're always negotiating with these because they're feelings about home. This is one of the most wonderful things about Australia, is this amazing bird called the Australian magpie. Uh, even smarter than a crow, if you can imagine, related to crows, very smart bird, uh, puts out one of the most, <coughs> most, most, most haunting and mysterious bird songs we'll hear anywhere in the world. Um, I put a picture of it here because um, this bird also, I think, makes my point in a really interesting way. Every, um, every spring, these birds are nesting. Um, and every spring, when the birds start nesting, you will hear on the, on the evening news, look out, the magpies are nesting. Because what that means is that when a, when a, a magpie establishes a nest, they establish a very large defensive perimeter around that nest, which often encompasses, say, a couple of public streets, <laughs> such that anything that's happening in those streets, they will experience as an attack on home because they set their sense of home very wide. That's one of the most important decisions we all make as individuals, by the way, is how far out from our bodies does our sense of home extend? I think we mostly have a sense that there are several gradations of that. You know, this particular degree of defensiveness that we have about our bodies, a slightly less but very strong degree of defensiveness that we have about our homes or apartments, a slightly larger degree of defensiveness that we have about our neighborhood, maybe a slightly larger one about our city, maybe a slightly larger one about our country. So there are actually steps. But the magpie is interesting because it has a very monotonous, uniform defensive perimeter that goes about 20 or uh, that goes you know 20 or 30 meters away from its nest, and therefore often encompasses a public street. They are interested in anything that moves down that street at something like the speed of a hawk or any or their natural predators. Uh, the natural predators on their eggs, not themselves. Um, well, pedestrians move too slow, uh, and um, cars mostly go too fast. But cyclists are just like. <laughs> and there is spring, you will see uh, people riding their bicycles and magpies doing soaring from great heights and coming right down on them and doing this. <laughs> Often going right through those little air slots in the helmet. Very painful. Has caused crashes, has caused some serious injuries. Uh, and if you're, if you're ever in Canberra or, or in any big Australian city in the spring where these things are, you'll notice that cyclists all have little pieces of, of, of brightly colored like pipe cleaner that they glued to the top of their helmets. They're sticking out very straight because everyone looks like a space alien. <laughs> because that apparently dissuades them uh, for whatever reason. So why am I talking about this, this wonderful bird? Because this bird is a wonderful example of Nimbyism. That's what Nimbyism is. Nimbyism is about home. Nimbyism is about the natural feeling that we have to defend home 
and the um, and and the fact that it's not so just a mammalian feature, that it is something we share with birds and reptiles, means it is way deep down in what we are, and not something that anyone is really going to successfully argue against with any sort of information. Um, it goes to the point too about um, whenever you're fighting with local businesses about wanting to remove some on-street parking for, say, a bus lane or something like that. This you, you throw all, you have lots of meetings and you throw a lot of numbers around, and ultimately it just comes down to a, a, a difficult decision for a politician because I have never known a an owner of a of a, mer of a merchant who's, who's um, shops looks on a particular street and has a bus who has a parking spot space on the street in front of his roof. I have never known one of them to say, you know, now that you've done that modeling, you're right. I don't need my parking. <laughs> I just I haven't heard, heard that happen. So you have to sort of expect that it won't. You have to design your political process in a way that honors the fact that we are all basically magpies, and we are all have some kind of defensive perimeter that we need to protect. So 